Who who gives you a phone call and says, hey, we got to stop the tendies on GME. This is getting <laughs> out of hand. Like who, who does that? Yeah. So, um, you know, the, the way that the back end systems work within the uh, brokerage industry is there's one central clearinghouse called the DTC. This has now become known lingo sort of outside of the, the people who have like are within the industry. Then sort of wrapped around there, there are a bunch of other clearing houses. And so those could be owned by big brokerage firms, uh, big banks. There can be independent ones. And we use an independent one called Apex. And then outside of those clearing firms, they serve broker dealers. And so, you know, and then broker dealers serve the end client. So it's sort of a concentric circle thing from end client to broker to clearing firm to central clearing firm. We were notified by our clearing firm, which is our access to the central clearing firm. Uh, that they were going to stop supporting trades within those three securities. And that they, they are a clearing firm to a lot of the other fintech companies. So us, Stash, SoFi, Webull, um, Betterment, um, even though Betterment doesn't support the, the individual security trading. Um, and you know we were notified by them that they were stopping access to clearing these trades. And so we, we you know, unfortunately had no option but to restrict access for our users or at least notify them that we I were see. intending to. So no, nothing you could have done. It was Apex who gave you the call for whatever reason Apex had. They're, they have complete control. So you're just like, ah, oh, crap. The best we could do is just send out a notification. Unfortunately, yes. Yeah, so, um, and, and not to, you know, trying to absolve ourselves of the responsibility. You know, we, we do use Apex as a vendor. And so we we view ourselves as the one who cut off access, but just in transparency, that is the mechanics of what happened of our clearing firm shut off our access. And therefore we had, we notified our users that we had to shut off their access. Is that, I mean, like, is, is Robin Hood when they're saying, Hey, you know, we're the one who shut off access. That's kind of similar to what you said. Is, is Robin Hood different here though? Like it, it seemed like they were negotiating money that they needed to have. And then there were questions of liquidity you know, can you speak to that a little bit from from what you know? Obviously, I know you don't work for Robinhood. Yeah, no. Um, so Robinhood has is obviously very large broker in the space. You know, one of the the premier fintechs and has you know their tens of millions of users and you know a lot of activity and, and the like. And even prior to their most recent funding, had raised a lot of capital. And so they've gotten to the size and scale where it makes sense for them to create their own clearinghouse. And so I forget the names, but there's, you know, Robinhood Markets and Robinhood Securities. And so their broker talks to their own clearinghouse, which talks to the, the central clearinghouse party. Um, I, they've been somewhat transparent, you know, maybe not initially, but then later on that the central clearinghouse uh, basically mandated an increase in deposits due to the risk in the system. I think that what was sort of overlooked is the risk in the system was really counterparties going bankrupt and not being able to clear the other side of the trade. And so, you know, they were worried that people were buying GameStop, the people who were selling it might not come up with it, or the people with huge option positions were going to go belly up and the like. And so the clearinghouse said, hey, if if Robinhood goes bankrupt, all the members are going to have to make up the difference. And so they started raising the deposits on some of these clearing firms. They raised a, you know, pretty substantially on Robinhood. And Robinhood at the time did not have the liquidity to post the collateral such that they could clear the trades. And so that led to the rationale of them sort of restricting one side of the trade that as people sold, it reduced their exposure, reduced their uh, deposit requirements at the NSCC, whereas people buying it would have continued to increase it and sort of had a spiral effect. Um, and so, you know, it sounds like they shut off access. We can debate whether, you know, like seemingly had you know material impact within the, the overall market of what was happening in the securities at the time. Um, and then, you know, had their capital infusion of the billion and then the 2.4 billion to, to bolster their liquidity to uh, account for scenarios like this. Wow. So that's interesting. So can you elaborate a little bit on what do you mean when you say counterparties going bankrupt? So somebody listening to that, help. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. So um, some of this has to do with securities, um, equities, and most of it has to do with options. And so, you know, the DTC and SCC has been um, sort of of the focus. They deal in securities. There's also the OCC, which is the Option Clearing Corporation, which deals in options. And I do think that the, they were also a, a part of this thing, but potentially overlooked. Um, the big thing is, you know, when like, we're, we're familiar with short selling now, and so, you know, people who are short the 
security, so short GameStop, have subsequently sold it. So it's not in their possession. They have it sort of a borrowed, but it's you know on a it's only a ledger like balance. It's only sort of a database entry that says, hey, it's on loan, but we've sold it elsewhere. If GameStop, you know, if if it was 10% of their portfolio and GameStop 15x, they lose money as the security goes up. And so they would have lost more money than is in their account. And so you know, the person on the other side of the trade says, hey, I don't have any money to cover or repay you for this GameStop. And so the person who bought it basically can't come up with the money uh, or can't can't actually get the security. And so that's counterparty risk is like the person on the other side of the trade doesn't fulfill their obligation due to them going bankrupt. This is even exacerbated further with options where you know, a lot of people were buying significantly out of the money calls um, on options. And there's someone on the other side of that. So they were selling a call. And so if GameStop's trading at 20 bucks and you know, you're buying an out of the money call at a hundred bucks, um, someone else has to sell that. It typically is the market makers, the citadels of the world, and they do a little bit of hedging by buying the security. But in some sense, what it was like is a lot of those people were sort of buying lotto tickets of really low cost ways to, if the stock skyrocketed, they could get you know a huge payout. The like difficulty is there's someone on the other side of that, of they're only collecting a little bit of money and there is a chance that they have to have a massive payout. And there was so much risk in the system that it was a question of whether the people who were fundamentally responsible for doing the payout of that sort of lotto-esque return would actually be able to cover that or whether it bankrupt them completely. And at which point the sort of like Delta spills over into the central clearing firm, the clearing firms, the brokerages and the like, and it just becomes a a disaster is, is probably the, the best way to put it. I mean, in, in some sense, it, it kind of sounds like uh, Cit Cit there was a real risk that, you know, we'll use them as the example here. Citadel could have gone bankrupt if GameStop went to the moon, you know, went to a thousand bucks, let's say. There's a real risk that Citadel could have gone bankrupt uh, because, you know, they're, they're writing these options or they've got to cover the shorts or whatever. Uh, and so it sounds like the clearing firms are like, oh my gosh, well, if they as a market maker go bankrupt, that could mess up the whole system. But I mean, looking at it from a user, it almost seemed like that was the goal to bankrupt Citadel. What would because I mean they're they're short in this company that everybody loves. Why not let them go bankrupt? Hey, laissez faire sucks for them. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, just want to be clear, like, and, and this is not you know, me having any allegiance to Citadel. Citadel is absolutely massive and they weren't at risk of going bankrupt, but there were a lot of, you know, hedge funds or, or different parties at the table where that could happen. And like I think, it, yeah, Melvin, you know, and, and I don't know the, the like particulars of like where their risk exposure was or their balances or, you know, how, how much it was, but like it was very known that they were short and were incurring significant losses. Um, and so, you know, there, there is a thing of if you have 10 million or 10 billion in their case of equity in the account and they lose $12 billion, they're in the hole, they're bankrupt. I they're, think the, yeah. the, the, the difficulty becomes who makes up that $2 billion. And typically what happens is it's the, um, like for an individual customer account of which Melvin will have a, a customer account at one of the large clearing firms, the broker or the clearing firm makes up the difference. And then if the clearing firm goes bankrupt, the entire system makes up the difference. And so it was really like the DTC trying to prevent a scenario where all of these losses spilled over and basically saying, hey, clearing firms, you need to prove that you have the capital such that you can clear these trades, that losses aren't going to spill over and fall onto other parties. And that is the reason that the requirements were raised so significantly across the board. And you know, on Robinhood, they, I think they had quite a bit of risk in the system with you know their open positions and option positions and whatnot and it was it's really incumbent upon the clearing firms to be capitalized well enough to to support that you know these black swan events that that can take place got it uh so what you're saying is the dtc this the the middle of sort of this centric system you were talking about they didn't want Melvin, the short seller in this case, to go bankrupt because it would have spilled over and it would have cost the clearing firms money. So in some sense, the clearing firms or DTC, they kind of did go out of their way to prevent Melvin, the short seller, from going bankrupt because they didn't want to be on the hook for any money. 
So instead, they changed requirements to make it so that, well, let's make it harder for Melvin to go bankrupt. So it kind of is like the suits protecting <laughs> Melvin because the suits themselves didn't want to lose money. So, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just add a little bit of nuance there and, you know, hopefully not get myself in trouble. Um, sure. I think the, the the big thing, I don't think that there was nefarious action where it was the DTC was in the pockets of the suit trying to to help this scenario. I think the DTC is in the thing of all the parties who are placing trades need to have the capital to clear these trades. It was unclear whether they do. And so they, as the sort of like central person making the rules, said you have to prove that you have the capital to to do these trades. I think it had the intended consequence of what you're talking about, that it forced one side of the market, the retail side of the market, who was the predominant buyers, to not be able to buy, which did, you know, I, I do think had a negative uh, ramification on the security and, and had price pressure associated with it, which in essence, did have the effect that you've mentioned, that it reduced the exposure or risk for the suits or the short sellers. It reduced exposure or risk for the clearing firms that you know they, they were going to like lose money and spill over. But I don't think it was sort of a, a you know backroom conversation of we are doing it for these purposes. I think it was an incredible amount of risk built up in the system. The central party said, hey, you need to prove that you can handle this risk the way that the brokers or clearing firms took action affected those on one side of the transaction, but it ultimately did reduce risk and it benefited those who were uh, selling or short and it you know harmed those who were buying or long the security. Got it. So, so super bottom line, the retail was winning so well that it could, like the entire system could have potentially had gaskets blow, multiple bankruptcies, and a bunch of spillover damage. And that spillover damage, we don't know what the ramifications of that would have been, but of course, they're looking out for their own self-interest as businesses, you know, clearing firms, they don't want to go bankrupt. So they're like, mm -mm, we, we got we to gotta calm this down before it's too late, so to speak. E even, even though nobody wants to come across as limiting the retail investor, that's basically what had to happen. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it's a fair assessment. It's, you know, a lot of the clearing firms make up the difference if their clients go bankrupt. And when you're you know, trading short, trading levered options, um, you do have the ability to lose more than is in your account. And so they are never, they're always incentivized to not let their clients go bankrupt. And so, you know, it like whether, yeah, it's due to regulations, due to, you know, firms making their own decisions, they were trying to uh, let a little bit of pressure out of the system. So it's not necessarily the SEC or the government saying, hey, we can't have this happen. It was it was really a clearing firm self-interest of we might lose money here if we don't do something. So I think it, it, it's twofold. I mean, clearing firms okay. do have to meet the, the capital requirements of the DTC. That is a you know regulated consortium, and that is how securities get cleared. If the DTC says you can't do it, you're sort of SOL, you know, it, it, that, that's the only mechanism to buy and sell securities and, and get them cleared. And so, you know, they, they do have to uh, conform to their standards. And when they say, hey, you have to post this collateral or get shut off, they have to post the collateral or get shut off. And if they don't have the collateral, they'll, they'll take it into their own hands of, of what to do. Um, and so, you know, it, it, I think it's first and foremost meeting regulatory requirements. Second, reducing, reducing their risk exposure that um, you know, like, I don't think it was coincidental, like people selling, um, GameStop on some of these clearing firms did reduce the clearing firms risk exposure. And so, you know, it, it, like it was helping with their, uh, the regulatory requirement as well as truthfully helping themselves out as a, a clearing firm to reduce overall risk. Got it. So, so you know, like it, it is a, like, one. yeah, the, the, the incentives were misaligned and I think in this scenario at the detriment to the retail customer. Um, you know, it, the opposite can be true at times, but it was a, I don't think it was a nefarious pointed perspective to, to lead towards that conclusion, but you know, the, like the way that the situation unfolded, actions were taken that harmed the retail investor at the expense of people on the other side of the trade. Got it. That's a, that's a powerful, powerful statement. So 
you had also mentioned that, and I don't know if this was the example or if this is probably what happened, but you had mentioned that the risk was counterparty risk and the clearinghouses said if Robinhood goes bankrupt, all the members have to make up the difference. So is it, you know, fair for other brokerages then to maybe blame Robinhood for maybe incentivizing the trading that happened to the, the options risk taking? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I think other people will have to, to come to that, uh, you know, conclusion. I, like, I do think Robin Hood has, has, they position themselves as democratizing finance, but in, in a lot of sense, what they're doing is encouraging short-term trading, meme stocks, like levered option play, which is which is fine, you know, it, like there's ab- obviously a, a demand for it and people can do with their money what they want. But I think it's a little um, hypocritical to, to say that they're doing otherwise. Um, and I do think when they encourage that type of behavior, they should be large enough to support it when it really matters. And so, you know, in times of huge volatility, like we saw last March or February and March during the coronavirus, they have to have uptime when, you know, things like this take place, they have to have the liquidity to post the collateral to, to clear the trades. And so I do think that it is the, the when they're taking the position of we are supporting levered short term option trading and, and, and the like, they should have the business uh, back end infrastructure to, to support that.